The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, if you wander in the slipstream between the viaducts of your dreams, be sure to watch out for those pipe-smoking joy killers, the unrealistic expectation nightmare jockeys, and their nasty whips of cynicism. Awards and rewards for great storytelling, plus we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Alliance of Equals, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editor Tony Daniel. We have a roundtable interview with two of the winners of the Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Award 2017. With us this time, it is an award sponsored by Bain Books and the National Space Society, and it's presented each year at the International Space Development Conference, very cool conference. This year's conference was in St. Louis, with us at the round table are grand prize winner Philip A. Kramer, author of the story Feldspar, which was the, the big winner, and runner-up Stephen Larson, author of the story Bullet Catch. Also with us at the round table is William Ledbetter, who is the long-serving and amazing contest administrator. Also, hey, Bill just won a Nebula Award for a short story. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Here's the news. Hey, here is the speech I gave at the Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Award when we presented the award to Philip A. Kramer. I thought this might give some helpful background on the award and the ensuing discussion coming up. Great science fiction strives to use a plausible future as a setting. This means that it is sometimes dismissed by otherwise thoughtful people because the exercise seems pointless. You can't really predict the future, of course not. Although I would strongly encourage you to put all your chips on the sun rising tomorrow, and if you do win on a long shot, you probably won't be around to collect on it anyway. Science fiction can be on the depressing side in the past few years, You have your dystopias, your zombie and nanotech apocalyptic landscapes, your virtual worlds where everyone is trapped inside a digital nightmare. But there's another kind of primal stuff of childhood, deep feelings within all of us that are just as basic and important. Curiosity, hope, awe in the presence of the magnificent universe we were born into. In science fiction, we tend to call these feelings the sense of wonder. That is a science fiction reader's bread and butter. It turns out that the best way to communicate that feeling is to take a great idea and tell a story, create great characters, and give them a fascinating problem to solve based on that wonderful idea. That is why the Jim Bain Memorial Science Fiction Short Story Award exists. The award is co-sponsored each year by Bain Books and the National Space Society. It honors stories about the near future where humans are striving to move upward and outward to create make money, make a life, and take to space in some manner. There will be problems along the way, of course. These are often created by the very endeavor itself. Solving those problems are what make the sense of wonder feel authentic and earned in a story. And this is the sweet spot we are looking for in the stories we choose to receive the Jim Bain Memorial Award. It's been an amazing journey for going on 11 years now. From the beginning, it's been helmed by our amazing administrator, William Ledbetter, who does a stupendous job, Bain Books will be putting out a 10th anniversary anthology in October at Booksellers Everywhere that will collect the best and brightest stories from the past contest winners, so look for that. This year we are honoring Feldspar, an excellent story by Philip A. Kramer that is set on Mars. It's a great examination of the way the sense of wonder and ambition for creation can be just as important, maybe even more so, to humans who work with robotic and remote craft in exploring and building a future in space. Philip is with us today, as are our second and third place winners. These are Stephen Larson, author of an excellent story involving railguns and CRISPR DNA technology. That one's called Bullet Catch. And also with us is M.T. Wrighton, 
author of the story An Economy of Air. This one is a moon-based story about what a real rough-and-tumble frontier might be like, filled with rugged individualists, sometimes in contention with corporations trying to make a buck. Part of the JBM Award is professional publication at professional rates. Philip Story Feldspar and Stephen's Bullet Catch will both appear on the Bain.com website on June 15th, so absolutely you can go read them there. You will find the great stuff we saw when we chose them out of the dozens and dozens of other entries. So now let us present the Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Award for 2017 to Philip A. Kramer for his science fiction short story, Feldspar. Hey, want to welcome the winners and one of the grand prize winner and the runner-up and uh, Bill Ledbetter, all part of the Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Award that we always give out at the International Space Development Conference each uh, that's co-sponsored with the National Space Society. And Bill, who is a Nebula winner, Bill Ledbetter, William Ledbetter. Um, Amazing, huh? Is also um, our curator, uh, the, uh, the what do you call it? The, the Jim Bain Memorial Award Short Story Contest. <laughs> you're the, well, you're the... the, the administrator. Administrator, yes. So, welcome, everyone. Hello. Hi, Hi Tony. Tony. There we go. <laughs> so, um, can, Bill, can you um, sort of explain what the award, what, by the way, all right, so what's the story that won the Nebula this year, and... Um, where did it appear? How can we read it? Yeah, uh, my my story. It was a novelette, and it was called "The Long Fall Up," and it was published in the in the May June issue of Fantasy and Science Fiction. So, very cool, very cool. So, we'll look for that. And uh, so, tell us about what the Jim Bay Memorial Award is, how it came about, and then uh, maybe introduce our our winners for twenty seventeen. Sure. Yeah, uh, this is the actually the eleventh year of the contest. Um, it started out as as a one off, uh, and f when my uh, local science, my local national space, uh, uh, my national space society <laughs> chapter was going to host the ISDC in Dallas, um, and the the contest was uh, uh, was very um, very well received. And yeah, SDC is this annual conference. Uh, yeah, it's the annual conference for the National Space Society, um, and it's held in different cities most years. And um, and we our chapter decided that a short story contest would just be great. And uh, but we in order for it to kind of meet National Space Society's uh, goals, we wanted it to be near future. Uh, humans exploring space. Um, we wanted that to be the focus of the contest, and, and it has been that ever since. And after Jim Bain uh, passed away, um, uh, we decided to name it uh, as, as a memorial to, to him, because um, he was very much into this kind of science fiction, and, and the National Space Society agreed, and we've been running it pretty much the same since, ever since then. So. Yeah. Often these, I mean, they're not necessarily upbeat stories, but they don't think going to space is a bad idea, basically, in general. Yeah, we uh, we generally try to show technology and and uh, and space exploration in, in either, if not a positive light, at least not as the bad guy in the story. So, if you send me a story where where everybody, you know, they run out of air and everybody dies, and it's all because we shouldn't have been in space to begin with, it's probably not going to win the contest. So... You know, that kind of thing. Unless it's sent from a prison and you threaten them. Well, yeah, there's that. Yeah. <laughs> Always that. If you're outside <laughs> context in the Brotherhood. So, <laughs> so, uh, so um, introduce our, our winner and our uh, first runner-up here. Right. Uh, the winner, uh, the first place winner is uh, Philip Kramer. Um, and his story was called Feldspar. Very interesting story. Um, I'll let him explain it. Um, and our second place, uh, our second place winner, our runner up is, is Stephen Lawson, yes, sir. <laughs> Stephen Lawson. And, uh, his story was called bullet catch. And that was really an interesting concept as well. Yeah. Um, by the way, we have had winners, uh, from multiple countries. Our, our winners seem to be Americans, um, this year, but we, 
Yeah, okay. We've had yeah. entries from other places. We've had winners from other places. We've had just about every kind of gender you can name. Uh, yes. That is it, too. So. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> yeah. so we've had a lot of winners. Um, you got, and often our winners have incredibly interesting and rich backgrounds that are also really cool. Um, that's one of the fun parts of, um, of meeting them and coming to these conferences is because, um, for instance, Philip um, is going to cure my aging problem. <laughs> and and um, Stephen, right? Mm -hmm. And Stephen is going to protect my house with his helicopter. So um, let's let's talk about your backgrounds just a second, so that we can uh, can can sort of uh, see some of the uh, some of the background that led you to write. Um, tell us how you came to writing, but also tell us about what you also do. Uh, you know, while you're supporting yourself with your writing. So that you can one day be a biochemist. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, uh, first off, thank you guys for uh, having me here. Um, yeah, my, my background is kind of uh, straightforward. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's the traditional path to being a scientist, but um, I did start off uh, not knowing at all what I wanted to do with my life, um, as most uh, freshmen in college. Um, I actually started off as an English major. And I think after about a year of that, uh, I had one of my uh, English major professors uh, tell me that people don't go into writing to make money. And as you know, true or untrue as that might be, um, really just kind of decided that you know I had another passion, um, one that may make more money, um, and that was science. And did you read a lot uh, of science fiction, especially when you were younger, or? Or books in general. You're yeah. a big reader. That was why you decided English might be the way to go at first. Yeah, that my my love for reading really started in uh, uh, high school. Um, I was the the person that would be sitting in the library while everyone else would be having fun at their uh, lunch breaks. <laughs> um, yeah, and it was everything. I, I read uh, sci-fi, read fantasy, um, and really that's what kind of made up my mind that I, I wanted to be a writer. I took a um, creative writing class senior year in uh, high school and started writing then and never really stopped. And throughout the your um, training as a scientist, you were, you, were, you were writing all along as well. Uh, so what is your training as a scientist? What's the... Yeah, so um, I started off, uh, um, I got my uh, um, bachelor's degree in biology. Uh, I was a medical technologist then. Um, and, you know, from that, I, I learned that I love the lab. Um, I love to learn about uh, medicine and uh, science, uh, but I didn't necessarily want to be working night shift for the rest of my life uh, in a hospital, um, just putting, you know, blood and other body fluids on instruments. So I uh, applied for grad school um, at a, the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And yeah, it really uh, took off then. You know, I did some uh, classes, I did some uh, laboratory rotations, and really just uh, settled on um, a love for um, studying aging and metabolism and uh, oxidative stress. And yeah, ever since uh, then, uh, when I um, after I graduated, I uh, am now pursuing my uh, uh, postdoc at uh, the University of Washington. What was your PhD? Uh thesis um, dissertation. Yeah, it was uh, it was actually focusing it combined a bit of my uh, my undergrad studies as well as my grad school studies. Um, I did have to deal um, with those same uh, uh, but blood and body fluids that I was trying to get away from. Uh, I got uh, samples from a number of patients um, with different diseases, isolated uh, their white blood cells, and uh, measured their metabolism and our overall goal was really to see if uh, their metabolism was reflective of uh, their disease or if there was some disease mechanism uh, um, that we could we could observe directly in the, the metabolic profile of these cells. Well, and all the while you were also working on a high fantasy trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. Yeah, I started at about uh, 18 or so um, and, you know, it took me about 
10 years to write a couple of books in that series, um, going to, to school full time. Um, yeah, but once I, uh, finished with that, I really, I don't know what took me so long, but, um, I started, you know, I had this idea for sci-fi, um, short stories as well as books and just have been, uh, writing sci-fi since then. What about you, Stephen? You, um, you're in the Navy, right? You started out in the Navy in the long ago before time. <laughs> so many, many years ago when I graduated high school, I joined the Navy. So I was in the Navy for, for five years, uh, got out completely after deploying for three times. I uh, did Allied Force uh, Operation Enduring Freedom. We we're the first carrier battle group deployed to bomb Afghanistan on uh, September 19th. Um, and then I got out at the beginning of Iraqi Freedom. Uh, I did my undergrad at Asbury University. I got a business degree, uh, minored in econ, and I'm working on an MBA now. That actually kind of feeds into my story, Bullet Catch, more than my military experience. Um, but uh, your guy is a, is a is a entrepreneur. He on definitely Mars he definitely is. Um, yeah, a lot of the stories. Um, underlying themes are, are economic incentives for space colonization and incentives to make people do things. Um, you know, how, how a colony of Martians would work together, uh, what would make them, uh, want to cooperate, uh, economically and things like that. Um, I fly helicopters now for the National Guard, but it also allows me uh, enough time to write and, uh, uh, enough income to pay my bills. So it works out well. Nice. What kind of helicopters do you fly? I fly the Lima model Blackhawks um, for the Kentucky National Guard. Those are attack. No. Um, what are they? Well, the the Blackhawk can actually be outfitted for attack, but the only people that do that is the 160th SOAR uh, Special Operations. Um, they actually perform better than the Apache in the initial tests, um, and carried the attack uh, gun battle in Panama when the Apache was first fielded. We use them for. Um, uh, troop lifts and Kazavak and Medivac. Uh, the ones that I fly are designated uh, Kazavak aircraft right now, so they got a hoist in the back and things like that. That's cool. And you are, uh, strangely enough, Bane seems to attract uh, helicopter pilots who are also riders. Uh, so, what, um, how did you come to riding? You're a uh, past uh, uh, placer in the Writer's Future contest, right? Um, so I've been writing for a long time. Um, I think my my folks told me I was kind of always off in my own little world when I was younger. Um, my mom actually taught me to read and uh, kind of homeschooled me for the, the first year of my education, kept me out of kindergarten. Um, but I, I got into creative writing in middle school with this extracurricular called Power of the Pen, so I went to some competitions for that and did uh, reasonably well at it. Um, I didn't really get serious about writing. I kind of dabbled, but I got serious about it when I came back from flight school, and I realized I could keep food on the table, um, but I also had enough time that I could uh, kind of balance my life with writing. So I entered a lot of contests. Um, I started winning... Uh, I think it was 2012 was my first uh, low-level publication, and then uh, I've been making progress from there. Uh, I just had a my five uh, most recent acceptances have been pro-level, and it's it's happened within a short where, amount of time. Where have they uh, been taken? Uh, so Daily Science Fiction on May 17th published uh, my flash fiction piece Game Theory, um, which is about performance enhancements and hypocrisy. Um, uh, Orson Scott Card's Intergalactic Medicine Show has my story. Uh, it's an urban fantasy called Leaders Taste Better. It'll be in uh, issue 57 in June. Um, Galaxy's Edge, uh, edited by Mike Resnick, uh, accepted... Um, oh, man, what's the name of my story? <laughs> uh, the Death of Arthur Owsley, uh, which, which... That probably has the most philosophical backing of any story. It's about the things that we choose to look at in life, whether they're good or bad. Uh, if we could see all of them, what would you choose to look at? Um, and there is a, uh, obviously, uh, Bullet Catch is, is going to be published as well, since uh, Bain is gracious enough to take it. Um, and then the, the Writers of the Future story as well. 
uh, Moonlight won. That's cool. Yeah, um, part of the of, of winning the contest is that um, you get published on the website at um, professional rates, and we have had some wonderful stories up. In fact, uh, maybe we should talk. Let's talk about that uh, anniversary. Uh, you're a Writers of the Future alum, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I won. Uh, I was in uh, volume twenty-eight, so it's been a few years ago. And yeah, the uh, um, you know, like I said, this is the eleventh year of the contest, and so we've just recently published. Uh, well, it's not for general sale yet, but uh, you can. You can buy it on, you can pre-order it on Amazon. Um, it's called the Jim Bain Memorial Award, um, first 10 years, but it's, um, the first decade, sorry. Um, and it's, it's not the entire, uh, number of stories, but it's kind of the best of. So, um, it, and so the best, best stories from those first 10 years, you know, it's, uh, uh, it was it was it was a lot of fun to put those together and, and to work with these writers again and uh, um, I think if anybody that, that's wanting to uh, enter the contest if they if they read this anthology you're going to get a really good taste of, of what we're looking for because these are these are definitely the, the type of stories that we're we want to find and publish so. yeah, that will be out um, in October right it's a uh, October trade paperback out from Bay. It'll be at booksellers everywhere, so uh, pick that up. Also, of course, it'll be at Bain Books, Amazon, or for download anywhere you might want to do that. We'll probably have the eARC out um, relatively soon as well, probably in June, July, probably in July. Cool. Um, we'll you'll be able to get the eARC as well, which is this you know the Bain program of, of selling books that have many typos for a lot of money. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, it has it has stories by Brad Torgerson and uh, like Martin uh, Shoemaker. Um, um, wow, that's just the two that pop um, popped at the top of my head. You know, David Levine. Um, who else? It's like uh, uh, KB Rylander. Um, that was last year's winner, wasn't she? Or no, that was that was Amy Ogden. She's in there too. Oh, Amy so, Ogden. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she was cool. Um, she, uh, what did she do? It was the, uh, oh, the, the asteroid mining. Yeah. The, the, yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about the, uh, so uh, that anthology will be out in October, and it's it's going to be great. It's got a beautiful cover by somebody. Uh, Bob there. Eggleton. Eggleton did the cover. Yeah. The f- most famous science fiction artist of all time. Yeah, I love his Winner stuff. Multiple Zulpinal, um Awards, uh, who does beautiful landscapes. I, it, it's a it's a gorgeous cover. Um, so uh, ch- so check that out. And we'll, of course, um, have Bill on the podcast to talk all about it, and so maybe some of the writers as well, to maybe have a little reunion uh, roundtable. That'd be great. That would be fun. Yeah. So let's talk about the stories, uh, the stories that won this year. Philip, tell us about Feldspar. Um it's a really cool um, science-based uh, problem story that um, that that a lot of gamers are going to identify with. <laughs> I think. I think. Definitely. Um, yeah, I couldn't say precisely what inspired me to to write this story. Um, it, it's been kind of in the works for years, just writing notes, um, things that I learned about Mars, um, and. I actually, the reason why I wrote it um, was I, I had spotted this uh, this memorial contest contest last year, um, but didn't really have anything to submit. So I kind of put the story, um, you know, just on my calendar um, to start writing it so that I could submit for next year. Uh, yes, this the story is about a, a near future um, where really the the space industry is pioneered by uh, the gaming industry. Um, so I guess the, the space industry, or rather the gaming industry, realized that people that would work really hard and even pay money to work really hard were uh, gamers. They would do uh, tasks that most people would consider work, uh, whether it be asteroid mining or um, harvesting uh, Martian regolith. Um 
so yeah, they they created these uh, tiny rovers, sent a bunch to Mars, and uh, gamers bought these the, the operating rights to these rovers. And really, this is the story is set five years or so after this has been going on. And one of the the gamers that's really invested his his life into it is a, a character named uh, Blake. He's um, kind of a loner outside of uh, San Francisco. And, you know, over the years, he's just been uh, directing his, his rover to harvest this uh, Martian regolith, uh, take it back to the uh, smelter that was kind of crafted out of the booster um, from the rocket that took him to, the, to uh, Mars. And this smelter would uh, render the, the regolith down to uh, some wire that it would feed back to the rovers, and they would use this to 3D print uh, any structure yeah, they wanted. Yeah, that's a super cool idea. Do you think that's the way 3D printing will maybe work? Um, the... So this is this is kind of my take as to how they might do this. Um, I've seen other, this isn't, you know, I'm not the first to, to come up with this, um, but some of the other um, possibilities that are thrown out there are kind of like a, a laser welding thing. So they don't they don't actually take iron oxide from the regolith. They use a laser to kind of uh, melt its components together in kind of like a concrete uh, uh, surface, I guess you could say. Um, and I didn't really think this was a very efficient thing. Uh, really, the, the main reason why I thought taking the, the iron oxide out of the, the Martian uh, dirt would be valuable is in part because you're uh, you're liberating all of that oxygen. And, you know, that's probably uh, why the, the company you know, got its start is, you know, the company, the gaming company is called uh, Terraform Games. And their thinking was, you know, liberate all this oxygen that's trapped in the dirt and you'll terraform uh, Mars. And never really happens. Um, it may be impossible to do with just a uh, hundred rovers or so, but um, yeah, that's the uh, the general premise. Um, and I I liked the idea of you know with the advent of all of these uh, 3D printing technologies and especially uh, metal 3D printing, I thought it would uh, uh, be well received. Yeah, well, we don't want to do any spoilers, but um, one of the th I mean the the setup of the story is that um, now um, astronauts have come. Or whatever you call them, marchionauts, um, have come, and one of them gets in some trouble. Um, and but Mars has really been settled um, by gamers who uh, have these remote presences, right? I mean, he's devoted. Blake has devoted his life to this. Correct. Um, yeah. So the the Eos mission. Um, this is named after uh, the Greek god of the dawn, who um, was kind of a um, consort to Ares, uh, the god of war. Um, and yeah, so uh, these astronauts arrived on Mars about six months um, before the story starts. Um, and Blake has kind of been, you know, monitoring the, the NASA feed, you know, where they, they talk about the mundane things of getting a colony up and running. And it's not really until uh, he stumbles across uh, some footprints that belong to one of the astronauts way outside of their exploration zone that he feels like he might be able to to help and be a part of this mission yeah it's cool it's a it's a great story and um, we're really pleased to be able to publish it it will be out by the way um, on the 15th of june it'll appear on the website along with steven's story um, which i think will be under it so we'll do like a tiered presentation of the two stories uh tell us about bullet cash well, now that I know what Phil's story is about, I know why it won, because that sounds phenomenal. Uh, Bullet Catch is um, it's a story of a guy named Vincent who works in a he works as a contractor in a Mars colony. This is also a Mars story. Yeah. It is. We all, I mean, it seems like Mars is our theme this year. A lot of times we get lunar stories or we get asteroid stories, but uh, Mars seems to be the theme. So go ahead. Uh, so Vincent is... Um, under the guise of planetary defense, he's built a railgun, and he is launching um, tubes with platinum 
uh, back to his brother on Earth so that he can invest them for him. Um, and they've, they've developed a deceleration mechanism for these railgun tubes uh, where they'll, they'll impact the snow and they'll go down this long chute and uh, be decelerated that way because they don't have any other way to stop them without destroying them. Why is it cool to have a, ra- a railgun rather than just... Uh, the thing I like about railguns is you can use, uh, obviously there's a capacitor system, so you could store energy from anywhere. Uh, that could be from the sun or any energy source. So it's basically a renewable launch platform as long as you, um, you know, with a, a helical structure or something like that, you, you are able not to bend the rails on this railgun if you advance your technology to that point. Um, it's renewable. And fast. Very, very fast, yes. Not something humans could use, but something you could send. We, we couldn't launch people with a real gun or they would be liquefied at the back of the yeah. tube. That was always the problem with the Jules Verne uh, book, right? If you blasted out of the right. cannon, you would be dead instantly. Yep. So, uh, so he's a bit of an entrepreneur. He's, he's, he's been operating in a stealth manner, uh, your main character. He is, and he has an incentive to kind of lay low, um, and then uh, obviously due to cosmic radiation, uh, there's a, a lady astronaut um, who becomes pregnant. She realizes uh, there's a deformity in her uh, in her fetus. Uh, I actually had a pediatrician friend who gave me some advice on neuroblastoma. Um, Why is it a problem on Mars? Which um, I knew, but it was kind of cool to be reminded of uh well outside of earth's earth's magnetosphere um shields us um if like high level um airline pilots flying at high altitudes will get a higher dose of cosmic radiation than those of us walking on the surface or um astronauts outside of earth's magnetosphere uh get hammered with this stuff and if you were outside uh working long enough um you'd get cancer or other kind of gene mutations um, just from the radiation alone uh, so that is one of the biggest hurdles to uh, interstellar travel or or space colonization is is shielding us from that effect. Mars just doesn't do a good job of that. Um, I, I know a lot of uh, researchers, obviously near the the volcanic activity and Olympus Mons and other places, there are lava tubes that they've looked at for shelter. But if you look at a lot of the con- concept illustrations um, for Mars colonizations, they're just living in bubbles on the surface, which unless we have some kind of new new technology or we terraform to the point that we have a magnetosphere, I don't see that as possible. So, uh, baby in danger. Child in danger. <laughs> and a uh, guy who knows how to get things. So the, the You also bring in the genetic engineering. Uh, angle, which was cool. Um, You just assume that this is going to work in in this future, because um, I I like the idea... It's not a problem on Earth when the baby gets this. Right. I did some research on CRISPR. I didn't know a lot about it. Uh, I did a lot of research from this story, because I don't have the same kind of educational background Phil does to just uh, fill in the gaps with my own experience. But... um, yeah, CRISPR is, it seems like a gateway to all sorts of things, gene editing, uh, curing cancer, and all, all kinds of things. It may be too good to be true, but I see it as a, a solution for, for a lot of our um, species problems, uh, like genetic disorders. Yeah, we've had, uh, we've had uh, Dan Cobalt wrote us uh, a couple of pieces on that, by the way, on the website on Bain.com, nonfiction pieces. Which can be had also in the uh, free nonfiction 2016 and 2017 uh, collections, the ebook downloads, Devaney books. So, um, and these stories will be in, as well as um, being on the website, they will be in the free short stories 2017 ebook anthology because we collect all of the short stories. Um, you may have noticed in your contracts. Well, you haven't gotten yours. <laughs> that that's part of the deal. Um. So even when they're not up anymore, you can still download them or read them in ebook form. Um, and we have all of the, uh, all the since Bain.com began publishing short stories, we have all of the uh, all the stories collected that you can get at the at our ebook site um, in any format that you want. So that'll be cool. So um, 
We are recording this the night before the ceremony. Um, I've done uh, a couple of these before, and Bill's done all of them. Um, how generally do we give out the award? It's pretty cool. Um, it's at a banquet, and we are one of the main attractions. Yeah, uh, all of the meals at the ISDC have have some kind of a speaker, and um, and and a lot of them have the the awards that are handed out during the conference are are kind of spread out over these meals. So um, sometimes we get a dinner, sometimes we get a lunch. In this case, it it'll be uh, lunch tomorrow, and um, so you know. Tony will get called up there, and he'll get to introduce uh, the winners and, and hand off the award trophy, and we'll get a few words from Philip, and and uh, and then we'll get to hear the uh, the main speaker uh, after we've had our delicious lunch, of course. Who uh, sometimes is an astronaut, or you know, usually some space entrepreneur, right? That yeah, was, yeah. The guy that did last time had all these incredibly expensive-looking jeans. That were distressed, but must have cost five hundred bucks. He was <laughs> obviously a venture capitalist guy. Yep. He was so dressed just like one. So, but he was really cool. He, had, you know, he had some really. I mean, there is some amazing stuff going on here at these conferences um, that you can find out about. And there's some amazing. You know, Buzz Aldrin was at our table a couple of times. Um, some people that are just on the cutting edge. Um, oh yeah. Yeah, you know, Musk has come around. Elon after. Elon Musk has been here. Robert Bigelow has been here. Um, you know, we've had just about everybody in in the commercial and 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 and, and even NASA um, directors have have come. I mean, so if you're a, a space enthusiast, this is where this is where the real movers and shakers in 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 the uh, uh, space industry show up eventually. So. And they got booths and stuff. They got a lot of panels and such, but there's also uh, a lot of vendors here that are kind of fun to to look at their stuff as well. Um, some great publications as well. Um, so, what is the process of the award, Bill? I mean, when do you, when are you going to open up for 2018? Uh, we'll open up in October, and it's generally open until the end of January, and then at that point. Um, I and my I, my intrepid slush reader Michelle Munzler, we we will have gone through all of the uh, stories and we'll pick ten and send those to the judges. And I send those to the judges with with no identifying uh, information on them, so the judges get them blind, and the stories are judged only on their their own merit. Um, and then once the judges pick, you know, with, you know, they do all their. Uh, uh, negotiating and, and you know decide amongst themselves which stories should uh, should win and how they are ranked. Then they give that information to me, and I announce it. Um, at some point, though, prior to that, we usually announce the the ten uh, finalists as well. So, um, and and those ten are always good stories. So I I don't I don't uh, envy the judges having to decide three stories out of those ten because they generally all have enough merit to be winners so yeah uh, I don't know David uh, Drake has been doing it for the last few years as, as our kind of celebrity judge I think um, we might get Sharon Steve Sharon Lee and Steve Miller in on it also at some point they've done it uh, they did it one year um, so yeah yeah and uh, and the main editors the uh, the Anonymous Bay editors uh, <laughs> yes. also have their input as well. Um, and then Tony tells us who wins. <laughs> <laughs> That's not right. No, no, no. So um, so what do you guys uh, want to do going forward? Are you going to write books? Um, have you been to some writing workshops? Uh, I think um, one of y'all been to the, that Kevin Anderson one, right? I went to the you went to Writers of the yeah. Future. He was at Writers of the Future. Oh, okay. He usually is every year. So. Oh, okay. And uh, are you going to do some novel projects? You want to just do short stories? What's the what's what's your uh, your calling? Oh uh, yeah. So uh, I've mainly been doing novels this past uh, several years. Um, it was only for the the Bain contest that I started. Uh, relearning how to how to write short stories um 
And yeah, now that I've I've reminded myself of that, um, I've just been cranking out several short stories. Um, submitted one to uh, writers of the future as well, um, and you know, uh, trying to build some writing credentials. Um, so hopefully, I could get a publication elsewhere with uh, one of my novels. Yeah. The um, the short story form is really cool in that it fits science fiction very well, I think, because uh, you have these crackling ideas that you can you can examine in a compressed and interesting form in a short story, right? It's um, it's a different thing to write a novel, um, and doing a short story is um, an amazing exercise in getting the the least amount of stuff you can to tell the story, right? Because you only have so much. Uh, are there any length requirements on these things? Or you... Yeah, I think our cap is 8,000 words. i um, heard complaints about that from some people, but it's like, get over it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you can do it. Yeah. These guys are, are testament that it can be done. <laughs> yeah. And Stephen, you're going to go over here. Um, so up to this point, I've been working on short fiction. There's a reason for that. Um, I, and Robert Heinlein said, uh, finish what you start. That's one of his rules for writing, uh, finish your writing, uh, and then send it out. Um, I think short fiction is easier to finish obviously because of its length. Um, so now that I'm sort of getting some legitimacy as a writer, um, I've carved out some time later this year to, to work on a novel and, um, actually a trilogy I've got a, a concept for that I think will kind of blow everyone's minds with its its unorthodox structure and maybe something people haven't seen before. So um, I'm excited about getting into that, but I know it'll be work too. Well, cool. So we're going forward, we're doing stuff. Um, these are great stories. They will be, um, we will announce the winner tomorrow, although we kind of know who won already because we did announce them. <laughs> We'll get the trophy out tomorrow at the, at the banquet. And um, then uh, the stories will be up uh, June 15th to read. And they're great stories, Feldspar and uh, Bullet Catch. So, um, Stephen Lawson, uh, first runner-up, and Philip Kramer, the grand prize winner. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, for the podcast. And Bill, thank you so much for doing all that you do. This is your baby. It's a wonderful, uh, amazing uh, project, ongoing, uh, whatever it is. Um, you've found some great people over the years, and uh, you bring them, this is a wonderful venue to bring them the recognition they deserve. So. I agree. Plus, I get to read all these cool space stories for free. Absolutely. <laughs> so, All right, let's go drink with some. <laughs> Not really. Rocket fuel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. This is another entry in Alliance of Equals, a Leaden Universe novel by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Beset by the angry remnants of the Department of the Interior and challenged at every turn by opportunist on their new homeworld of Sherbleek, and low on funds, Clan Corville desperately needs to reestablish its position as one of the top trading clans in known space. To this end, master trader Sean Yoskalen and Corville's premier trade ship Dutiful Passage is on a mission to establish new business associations and to build a strong primary route that links well with existing loops and secondary routes. But re-establishing trade and preserving the lives of the few remaining members of the clan aren't all of Corval's problem. Matters come to a head as Dutiful Passage, accustomed to being welcomed and feeded at those ports on its call list, finds itself denied docking and blacklisting while agents of the DOI mount an armed attacks on others of Corval's traders under the very eyes of port security systems. Traveling with dutiful trader on this unsettling journey is Patty O'Scalen, the master trader's heir and his apprentice. Patty is eager to make up for time lost due to Corville's unpleasantness with the Department of the Interior, but she is also keeping a secret so intense that her coming of age and perhaps her very life is threatened by it. And here is the latest entry in Sharon Lee and Steve Miller's Alliance of Equals.
Insulty, Dulcie murmured, scanning the items list. One is hard put to suppose that anything of interest could have happened at Insulty, Uncle said, pouring tea. That is precisely why we must view it, she said. Imagination clearly fails us. I agree. Dulcie cued the proper episode, and the two of them gave the screen their attention. The nightmare of congestion that was in Salty's normal traffic state unfolded before them, as seen from the angles of perhaps a half dozen ship eyes. It was a moment before it became apparent that it was not merely the crush of ships, but one ship in particular that was being followed. Beshimo, said the uncle, who had reason to know those lines well, and leaned forward slightly in his chair, watching as the ship was maneuvered into a tight approach with scarcely room for even a mathematical variation. If the pilot sneezes, Beshimo will bounce off of that rig, Dulcie said, apparently forgetting that whatever had happened there had been finished long ago. Behind the tightly boxed ship, another phased in, a corsair with the lines of a predator. Breath caught, they watched as more hunters appeared. Orders were issued, Beshimo was to yield to escort and prepare to surrender to authority. The answer to that was remarkably clear, as if the pilot had spoken directly into the calm of every ship about in Salty. Orsec 12, first class pilot Theo Waitley on Beshimo. Flying for Laughing Cat Limited here, be advised that we're targeted by three unannounced ships and that we are targeting in return. I am directing my exec and my ship to take immediate defensive and responsive action as required. We will not comply with your request while outside hunter ships approach. Evasive action indeed. The uncle realized that he had been holding his breath and took in air, his whole attention pinned to the screen. There was too much noise, pilots objecting, pilots demanding, the tumult went unheeded as Beshimo ran, and returned fire until the hunters, one by one, were lost in traffic. Except for one. That one leapt forward, firing what the energy grid at the bottom of the screen classified as neutrinos. Beshimo returned fire. The attacking ship was hit, the vid flickered, and when it steadied again, Beshimo was gone. There came more noise, pilots demanding to know what had happened, some few clever souls proclaiming that Beshimo had jumped others claiming that a jump in such traffic was impossible. The other ship must have been killed in the same blast that had taken the hunter. When at last it was over, Uncle took a deep and not entirely steady breath and leaned back in his chair, hands folded over his belt buckle, a slight frown on his face. You're not amused? Dulcie asked her voice quieter than usual. On one level, he said slowly, one must allow Pilot Waitley and Beshimo to be formidable, and one might almost feel a little sorry for the poor agents of the department. How could they have considered it possible that Beshimo's crew would give themselves up what were they thinking to provoke and attack with so many witnessing their actions? He flung a hand up and toward the screen, fingers sketching disdain. This is the enemy Corval cannot defeat. Nor can we, Dulcie observed dryly. He sniffed. Nor have we. Yet. Fair enough. But at this pace, there will be nothing left for us. Pilot Waitley and her ship will have eaten them all. Perhaps not, 
though certainly they are within their rights to take as many as they deem fit. He shifted somewhat in his chair. It is unfortunate that the actions of idiots pressed Beshimo into an indiscretion, again, with so many eyes upon them. I mislike that neutrino bath, Dulcie confessed. It seemed Beshimo's shields were thinning badly. I thought so too. And while we may sit here, comfortable in the knowledge that they long ago outmaneuvered brigands, within the moment it must have seemed as if there was nothing else to do save jump. The situation is regrettable, but survivable, most especially given Signor Vioni's work, eh? Dulcie smiled. In fact, when will she publish more widely? An excellent question. I think it must be soon, very soon. Andiri will be the first new stop on the route, father said, as Paddy brought him his wine. Before he had asked her to refresh his glass, they had been talking about her cartography coursework. But she knew him too well to be found on the wrong foot by so minor a change of topic as that. So it will, she agreed, placing the glass on the flat disk of green and blue mottled stone that served as a coaster. Paddy remembered the stern-faced person who had given it to him, Ambassador Vale King of Granda, as a gift of good faith. Ambassador Vale King hadn't liked Father, her dislike so plain that Paddy, who had been present at the meeting in her Melanti of Cabin Boy, had tasted sour grapes for hours afterward. Father had been amused by the ambassador, though Paddy hadn't been able to fathom precisely why. And in the end, neither dislike nor amusement had mattered, so far as she could see. Corval and Granda together reread the standing treaty. No changes were made, and both parties signed, accepting the terms for the next 12 years. Oh, and Father had gotten a pretty stone coaster. How do you plan to mark this momentous event? Father asked as she settled into the chair across the desk from him. She considered him blandly, her best trading face in place. I plan to mark the occasion by taking on cargo that I will sell for profit at Chessel's World, she told him seriously. Father's eyebrows rose. He picked up his glass and settled back. But how piquant. Tell me more. The urge to sit up straighter and stiffer in answer to his comfortable slouch was almost irresistible. Nonetheless, Paddy resisted it, sitting respectfully at attention as befit a prentice in the presence of a master, but with muscles relaxed and face bland. My studies have shown me that Chessel's world is the largest importer of my laster in its quadrant. Demand long ago outgrew the planet's ability to produce it. The homegrown sort is triple A grade and is reserved to the red cap cast and above. The rest is imported, which means that the lower castes pay too much for a product that is often inferior. Shocking, father murmured, his silver eyes half closed. But tell me how you will turn this sad situation to your hand. Easily enough, Paddy answered. Andiri produces my laster, enough for its needs, which are modest, and a surplus, which is sold for export. She leaned forward, her elbows on her knees and her eyes on father's face. Andiri, my laster, does eventually find its way to Chessel's world, she continued. But it is transported slowly via serial transfers between looper ships. 
By the time it arrives at its market, it is not in the best shape, nutritionally, and the transport costs have raised its price considerably, though the trader's margin is small. This is dreadful. Neither side of the trade is satisfied. No, she dared to correct him. Both sides are grudgingly satisfied, but neither is happy. However, you have a scheme that will repair this situation. I have a scheme that will deliver a superior product to market and which will provide a profit for us, dutiful passage. He raised his glass and gestured with it, an invitation to continue. The passage is not a loop ship. We propose to jump from Andiri to Chessel's world. We will therefore have only our own transport expense in the equation with whatever the cargo itself costs. At Chessel's world, we can undersell our competitors very slightly while earning a significantly larger profit for a superior product. My recollection of the lists suggests that Mylaster, despite its popularity at Chessel's world, is a low-end item. Yes, she acknowledged, that makes it fitting spec cargo for a prentice who is neither plump in pocket nor likely to be sought out in the marketplace for her name alone. How much do you intend to commit? She named a figure fully half of her original spec fund for this trip, reserving those small profits she had gained at their previous ports. Depending on supply, of course, she added. That is quite a lot of money, he commented. She allowed herself a smile. I wish to become considerably plumper in pocket, as who does not? Well, you appear to have thought the matter out. Please, keep me informed of your progress. Yes, Master Trader. Excellent. Now, I fear I must come the parent for a moment and allow you to know that Arms Master Schneider has been to see me, expressing some concern regarding your defense training. Paddy blinked. Concern? Indeed. He praises your abilities in Menfriat lavishly, and is quite convinced that you will eventually excel at a higher level. His concern, however, has to do with your, let us say, your willingness to embrace the ultimate answer to all questions. He expressed it thus, if she was in a street scrape, there wouldn't be anybody but her left standing. As arms master, he finds that you are too willing to adopt a single solution stance to multiple, oft times complex problems. Such inflexibility weakens your defenses. He also confided his concern that this dependence upon one solution springs not from control, but from a lack of confidence in your own abilities. He has therefore recommended that you be placed into the Debriat class taught by Lena Faldum. This will necessitate a very slight change in your schedule, which I trust will not discommode you in the least. You will begin with Master Faldum, your next on shift. Paddy took a breath, and another, struggling slightly. She had expected to be moved from her dance class, yes, but to a higher level within Menfriat. If Arms Master Schneider had been concerned about control, why could he not have spoken to her, his student? Surely he did not share Tech Vareth's absurd notion that her kin ties meant that she could not be corrected. She took a hard breath, aware that father had stopped speaking and was looking at her with curiosity. Surely, if my moves lacked control, she said, keeping her voice even, though she wanted to shout. Surely, if I were inept, Armsmaster Schneider had only to correct me. 
It is not, as I understand it, your moves which lack control, father said, his eyes on hers, but your motivation. I don't understand, she said, trying not to feel as if she had failed. Debriat, that was for babies. Well, no, of course it wasn't. Hadn't Silvor practiced Menfriat with them at the rock? Very focused he had been too, and his kills the cleanest of any of them, though she and Quinn had been dancing for years. But Debriat hadn't a use. It was all about describing graceful movements and breathing into the moment. It was... It was more akin to flower arranging than real dance. Paddy. Father's voice was soft, warm. She blinked up into his face. Sir? I wonder, child, if you've been experiencing any discomfort. If perhaps your head might pain you at odd times, or you are suddenly disoriented or frightened for what seems to be no reason. In fact, she thought irritably, he was wondering if she was Shah Dramliza, a healer, which she assuredly was not, nor would she ever be. Of that, she was determined. Oh, it was reasonable to expect that she might be. Father himself was a healer, and so was Aunt Anthora, though Aunt Anthora well, in any case, Corval was strong in the Dramlee's talents, talents that typically manifested when one became halfling. However, just because many of Corval became healer or Dramlee's did not mean that all of Corval did so. One need look no further than Quinn and cousin Patrin to find kin who were not healers, as she was not a healer, nor ever would be. She shook her head and smiled for father's care, which was proper. And really, she was quite fond of father and did not wish for him to worry. No, sir, nothing like that. I'm only running to keep up, so if sometimes I seem odd. No odder than usual, I think, father said, and gave her one more considering look before leaning back in his chair and reaching again for his glass. Well, now, I have heard your plans for Andiri and Chessel's world. Would you care to hear mine? I fear you'll find them considerably less bold than yours, and so I warn you. Only if you will explain what you mean to accomplish by meekness, she said. He smiled. Did I say meek? That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz, and kudos rockets, moon buggies, Mars rovers, and a sandwich made of what we think is ham. They're getting better at it all the time. Plus the thanks and praise of a grateful space nation to Philip A. Kramer, Stephen Lawson, and William Ledbetter, winners and the administrator of the Jim Bain Memorial Short Story Award Contest. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars.